So our next topic is going to be friction. And um, this is one way to describe friction. I, I wrote, friction is a force of resistance to motion when objects are in contact, specifically sliding contact. So when we have two objects that are sliding across each other, or perhaps even pending motion, like when something is about to start sliding, we have friction involved. And the friction equation states that friction is equal to this thing called mu times normal force. Now this is the general form of this equation. And the reason why I say normal force is because, well, on a flat horizontal surface, which is going to be mostly the types of questions that we do in this course, we have obviously gravity going down and we have normal force going up. Now the objects in these problems are usually only going to be having motion in the horizontal direction. Therefore, there's not going to be any vertical motion. So that means that the vertical acceleration is going to be zero. Which means that if we did the sum of the forces on this thing, and we get F net, it means that we have the normal force minus Fg equaling Ma. But since A is zero, this is going to equal zero. And we now know, therefore, that the normal force must equal the gravity force. In other words, the force that the ground pushes up on the object is the same force that gravity pulls down on the object. Now, if, that, if this is the case, and since we already know that the force of gravity is equal to the mass times the acceleration of gravity, please understand that this g here, here, let me write this again. This g is a subscript. Okay, That fg is a subscript. It's not two things being multiplied by each other. That's equal to mass times the acceleration of gravity. Therefore, when we're dealing with questions that are on horizontal surfaces, we can usually just replace this equation with this. So it's simpler now, but you might say, OK, well, why is the general form of the equation like this? Why differentiate between normal force and uh, the force of gravity? Well, the reason is because here, maybe I'll do it over here. So because I'm not we're not going to do these problems. But when you have a problem where you have a mass on a slope, now, the normal force, which is perpendicular to the surface, is no longer equal to mg. Now we have to go into some trigonometry to figure out what the normal force is. So in this case, the normal force is not going to be equal to mg. It's going to be, we're going to need trigonometry to figure that out. We're not going to do that right now. That's for a later course. But my point is that we can use this equation for now as long as we're dealing with horizontal uh, objects, objects moving horizontally. So what is this mu thing, this new variable? Uh, I think that's the way you write mu. And mu is the coefficient of friction. So why do they call it a coefficient? Well, the reason is if I take this equation here and solve for mu, look what I get. I get mu is equal to force of friction divided by 
force of gravity, or mg. Now that's the weight in the denominator. So essentially, what this uh, coefficient is, it's, it's unitless, okay, so no units. And also, it's going to be, well, first of all, before I tell you what values it's usually going to have, let's analyze this, this quotient, this division. Friction force divided by the weight, or the force of gravity. What is this? So I've made my image a little bit bigger because I wanted to actually show you this uh, visually. So when I have a scale here, and when I'm holding a one kilogram mass, you can see here that where the, the scale reads. Okay, so that is the weight of the object. Now if I turn the object around, so that's the denominator. If I turn the object around and I put my hand out like this, and I hold this scale and I pull it, notice it, you can see what I'm pulling with, but at a certain point, it'll start to move. And the force which, with which I am pulling horizontally, you can see the, the, um, the scale, right? Pulling with greater and greater force as I pull with my hand here. That is the numerator. So essentially, all I'm doing is I'm taking, now let me pause for a minute. I'm taking this numerator as the friction force pulling horizontally, and I'm taking the weight when I'm, when I'm lifting the object up as the force of gravity. All I'm doing is dividing these two forces, and that's what gives me my mu or my coefficient of friction. So it's just a ratio of, of how hard you have to pull versus how hard you have to lift. That's what the coefficient of friction is. Now knowing this, ask yourself this question. Is it, which one is more difficult? Is it more difficult to lift something off the ground or slide it on the ground. And most people would agree that sliding something on the ground is easier than lifting it off the ground. Therefore, the numerator is less than the denominator. So the, frisk, the force of friction is more than likely going to be, not more than likely, I, can, I don't want to say I can think of very weird situations where it, I could break this, but it's very, very, very uncommon. So, uh, and I'll just describe that in a second. But essentially, the force of friction is less than the force of gravity. Now, knowing this, since you know that the numerator is less than the denominator, now you know that mu is going to be less than 1. because if they were equal, if the friction force, the force to pull it horizontally, was equal to the weight of the object, then mu would equal 1.0. Now, that's usually not the case. So that means that mu is usually going to be less than 1. So it is a coefficient, a number, less than 1.0. Uh, when could it be 1.0? Well, think about this. Uh, there's there are situations where I have seen, let's say for example, um, motorbikes that there are these uh, mountains, and they try and have motorcycles um, you know, I can't draw a motorcycle here, but anyways, the motorcycle is, is trying to ride up the mo up the mountain but at the top of the mountain it gets really 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 steep 
So they need to be able to make this motorcycle have really good grip with the ground. So what they do is on the back tire, they put spikes on the back tire. Like, I mean long spikes. Now in this case, if this spike was to sink into the earth, now if you try and slide this motorcycle along the ground, it's going to be very difficult because essentially you're trying to like rip the ground apart as you slide it. That might be a situation where it's harder to slide something um, than it would be to lift it. Basically all I'm trying to say is if you had the ground and you had an object with spikes stuck into the ground, then obviously that's going to be <coughs> really difficult to slide. But this is a very unusual situation. Usually when things slide, when we're talking about friction, you simply have one material and another material on top of it, whether it's rubber or wood or some other material. You know, if, if we talk about um, I guess tires, you know, are made of rubber. Essentially objects like concrete, pavement, uh, metal, these are the types of things that would we, we're going to analyze in terms of one thing sliding over the other. However, let's go back and um, let's now figure out the difference between two different types of friction. One friction that we have is called oops, static friction. And the equation for this friction is equal to actually it's it's not an equal sign, it's actually a, a less than or equal to mu s times mg okay but again I want to give it to you correctly so I'll write fn here first and then I'll write it again there weird thing here is why did I write less than or equal to well first let me write down the equation for kinetic friction uh, Let's see if kin -ne -tick friction. And this one is equal to mu k times Fn. So it's the same equations, just the coefficient of friction changes. There we go. How are these how are mu s and mu k related. Well, mu s is greater than mu k. So this coefficient of friction is bigger than this one. Why? Well, static means no motion, so not moving. But kinetic friction means friction of motion. So that means this is moving or sliding. Now this is, this, I, I want to put a cross through moving here because we're going to see a situation that where we have a wheel. And if you have a wheel, you can actually have something be moving um, but still in static friction. So I should say instead of not moving here, let's say not sliding. Okay? And here we'll say sliding. This is a better representation of kinetic and, and, and static friction. Because I guess maybe I'll, I'll just mention it now. When we have a box on the ground and the box is not moving, it's not sliding. Okay, so this would be static friction.
But if we have a box on the ground that's sliding with a velocity across the ground, in this case, we have kinetic friction on the ground. Okay? So when can you, when does this kind of like not work for moving and not moving? Well, guess what? If you have a, uh, so th this is not moving and this is moving, okay? And I'll cross this out and say, and you'll see why now I want to say sliding instead of moving. So this is static and this is kinetic. But if we had the, a ground here and we have a wheel, this is an amazing invention. If the wheel is turning, that means the wheel has a velocity. But the question now is, is the contact point where the wheel touches the ground, is it sliding? And the answer is no, it's not sliding, it's rolling. So rolling and sliding are different. Rolling uses static friction. Okay? Whereas, if you have a wheel on the ground and it's not rotating, no rotation, now if the if the if the wheel is sli uh, sliding with a velocity now we have kinetic friction you notice the difference here this wheel is moving forward by rolling this wheel is moving forward by sliding on the ground okay Static friction is bigger than kinetic friction. That means when you're trying to stop a car, you want to keep your wheels rolling to have a greater force of friction. Once your wheels lock up and you start sliding, you have a lower kinetic friction. Why is that? Because mu k is less than mu s. Mu s is bigger. So it's always best to keep your wheels rolling on the ground. That's why we have something called anti-lock braking systems, ABS brakes. What they do on your car is they prevent your wheels from locking up and sliding, thereby reducing your friction to kinetic friction. Anti-lock braking systems sense when your wheels stop rotating and reduce the brake pressure to keep your wheels rolling and to keep your wheels with greater friction on the ground so your car can come to a stop more quickly. It seems counterintuitive, but actually when cars were in the olden times when not all cars had anti-lock braking systems, the way that you could stop your car more quickly was by pumping your brakes really quickly, thereby imitating what an anti-lock braking system would do. So let's now move to a, uh, so this, this, this example that I'm describing is specifically for wheels. Okay, But usually we're not going to deal with wheels. Usually what we'll deal with are just simply objects that are either sliding or not sliding on the ground. Okay, So let's say like a box that does not roll. So in this case, if I draw the graph of friction, versus applied force, 
Our graph looks something like this, where this, re this slope region here is our static friction, and this flat region is our kinetic friction region. In other words, if we had a box on the ground and we apply a small force, an applied force, then let's say our applied force is here. Well, if we go up here to the graph and we come over, that means the friction force, so let me actually uh, draw this again. I want to take this applied force and put it here. Okay, so here is an applied force. Now, the corresponding friction force always acts in opposition to the direction of motion. I believe I put that was in the notes. Uh, no, I didn't actually put that in the notes yet. Friction force is a force of resistance to motion. So let's put that here then. Friction force always acts in opposition to the direction of motion. Okay, so that means if we come back to this problem here, the applied force is to the right. That means our friction force is going to be to the left. Now this thing is not moving yet. That means if we go back to our, di our graph here, this is where that applied force is. And so the corresponding friction force would be here. Notice that as we increase the applied force, so let's say I push with this much. So if I now, in this case, it's the same box, but I'm, I have a bigger applied force, my friction force just becomes bigger. It's not big enough yet to move the object. It's only at this point where now, if you'll notice my equation, which is right here, that's why I have less than or equal to. It could be here, it could be here, or here, or anywhere on this line. But when it's equal to mu Fn or mu Mg, it's, we're right at this maximum point. Now, if I apply any more applied force, so let's say I apply this much force, now the object is going to slide, my, uh, my applied force becomes big enough, oops, such that it starts to slide now, it's now sliding here, and you notice that the friction force is smaller than what it was up here. Why is it smaller? Because, as I, I'm gonna write this again, mu k is less than mu s. This is my maximum force of friction, maximum friction static at this point. But along this point, as I increase the force, my kinetic friction doesn't change. It's always a constant value. But notice it is less than the maximum static. And we'll continue friction next time.